Hi, in this video we're going to talk about integration of trig functions. So we've talked about the antiderivative of just sine by itself, cosine by itself, tangent by itself. So now what we're going to do is start raising these to higher powers and taking the antiderivative. So there's going to be two types of problems. Powers of sines and cosines, like cosine squared times sine to the fifth. And we're also going to do powers of secants and tangents, such as secant to the fourth times tangent squared. In the first part, we're going to learn how to integrate powers of sine and cosine. And here's what is meant by this. Sine raised to the m power and cosine raised to the n power multiplied together. These numbers m and n should be integers. We're going to have different strategies based on whether m and n are even or odd. The first rule is that if at least least one of mn is odd, then what we do is we take one of that odd power. Say if it was sine cubed, then you would write sine cubed as sine squared times sine. If it was cosine to the seventh, you would write it as cosine to the sixth times cosine. So what we're doing is we're pulling out one from the odd power, and that's going to go off to the right in order to be part of the du. And then we'll finish the substitution from there. Now, if that sounds a little vague, that's because it's better if we do an example. Let me just throw in a little extra recommendation. If both m and n are odd numbers, it is easier if you do this pulling one out with the lower power because the resulting algebra just ends up being simpler. Okay, so that's the rule. Let's do an example. Now, as you can see, the power on the sine is 3, and that's odd. The power on the cosine is 11. That's also odd. Since at least one of them is odd, we're going to use the odd power strategy outlined on the previous slide. And since they're both odd, it is recommended to pull out from the lower of the odd powers. Now, this is what is meant by pulling out one of the odd powers. I'm writing sine cubed as sine squared times sine. Remember, we can multiply in any order. So here I'm just rearranging and pulling the sine off to the right hand side. And so this part is going to be our du. Now, if du is equal to sine, what is the corresponding u for that relation? It's negative cosine. So here what we're doing is we're essentially back constructing what the substitution is going to be based on the du that was pulled out from the odd power. Now let's do a regular substitution. Now, since negative cosine doesn't appear in my problem, I'm going to multiply both sides of this relation times a minus sign. So I'll have negative u is equal to cosine x. So let's see what we've got. This cosine here is equal to negative u, and it's raised to the 11th power. This part is the du. We set that up from the beginning, and now we have to figure out this remaining piece. Notice that the sine squared is raised to an even power. That's by design, actually. We started with an odd power. We set separated it into sine squared times sine, so sort of the odd part of it went into the du, and we're left with an even. Luckily, we have this really nice trig identity that allows us to rewrite even powers of sine in terms of even powers of cosine. In this particular problem, my u is equal to cosine, so this sine squared, boy, I wish that was something to do with cosine instead. That way I could rewrite it in terms of my u value. We're going to use this trig identity, subtracting cosine squared from both sides, we get sine squared is equal to 1 minus cosine squared. So this sine squared right here is the same thing as 1 minus cosine squared. Now cosine is equal to negative u. So we're getting 1 minus negative u squared. There we go. That's the hard part. That's the new part. And now this is a completely reasonable problem. We do have to FOIL and simplify a little bit. Now we can pull a minus sign out and FOIL everything, take the antiderivative and finally put the u back in for the final answer. And finally, we can do a little bit of simplifying here because a minus sign raised to an even power uh, will become positive. I'm going to do that and also distribute this minus sign, so my final answer is here. As usual, we can take the derivative of our answer in order to obtain the original quantity. Now this rule should make more sense. If at least one of the m or n powers is odd, then what you do is you pull out one of these odd powers in order to be part of the d you for the substitution. Then you just follow through and finish the substitution. A little extra piece of information that we found out as we went along is that if we pull one of the odd powers out, we're left with an even power. And that even power will need to be rewritten using the trig identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. What if no odd powers appear at all? That would be the case of m and n both being even. If m and n are both even, that means we'll have even powers of cosine and even powers of sine. If 
that's the case, then we need to use these trig identities here. I like to think of these trig identities like if I start with an even power of cosine, after I use the trig identity, I get an odd power of cosine because this cosine here is like cosine to the one power. So essentially, if you have even powers, you can use these trig identities to convert them into odd powers. Let's see an example. As you can see, sine and cosine are both raised to the second power. So they're both even. M and N are both equal to 2. So we're going to use those trig identities on the previous slide. This cosine squared is equal to the trig identity, and this sine squared is also equal to its corresponding trig identity. Now we've got a half and a half we can pull out in front of the integral to make a fourth. 1 times 1 gives us 1. Notice that the cross terms cancel out. If I do 1 times negative cosine, I get negative cosine, and 1 times positive cosine, I get positive cosine. So those cross terms cancel out. And then the final term gives me cosine squared. Now I can separate these two, the antiderivative of 1 and the antiderivative of cosine squared of 2x. Now the antiderivative of 1 is pretty easy, that's x. And now we have to do this remaining integral of cosine squared. Notice that the integral of cosine squared is actually easier than the original problem. The original problem was cosine squared together with sine squared multiplied. Now we're just down to a single cosine squared. So let's think about this. It's a power of cosine with the power being equal to 2. 2 is an even number. So what's the strategy here for a sine or a cosine raised to an even power? Well, we got to use these trig identities again. So the second integral is obtained using that trig identity. And finally, we can finish the problem. Pull the 1 half out in front, take the antiderivative of 1 in order to get x. We can take the antiderivative of that to obtain 1 fourth sine 4x. So here's our answer. Of course, we can simplify a bit in order to bring these x's together. So this is the simplest form for our final answer. So don't forget these rules that we've established. If at least one of m or n, or both, is odd, if any odd powers appears whatsoever, you pull one of the odd power out and then rewrite the remaining even powers using this trig identity. On the other hand, if no odd power appears and both of them are even, then we use these trig identities. Make sure that you have these rules written down before you come to class tomorrow. In the second part of this video, we're going to be integrating powers of secant and tangent. Now remember that the derivative derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So something to notice is that a single power of sine or cosine, the derivative is a single power of sine or cosine. So that was the operating principle when someone came up with the rules that we just covered on the previous slide. Now for secants and tangent, we don't just have the derivative of one being the other. For secants and tangents, it's a little more involved. The derivative of a single power of secant is equal to a single power of secant multiplied times a single power of tangent. And the derivative of a single power of tangent becomes a secant squared. So because the relationships in between secants and tangents for their derivatives are quite a bit different than sines and cosines, the rules are going to be different in this section. Here's the first rule for powers of secant and tangent. If the power on the secant is an even number, you're going to pull out a secant squared to be part of the du. If secant squared is the du, I hope you can figure out what the u is going to be for problems like this. It's tangent. Anyway, once you do that, once you pull out the secant squared to be part of the du, what you will have to do is similar to the previous problems, you're going to have to rewrite the remaining even powers of secant using this trig identity. Something a little extra to notice about this rule is that it's entirely in terms of the power on secant. This says if the power on secant is even, then do blah blah blah. Notice that this rule does not refer to the power of tangent at all. The power of tangent could be absolutely anything. Okay, let's do an example to see how this works. Now, remember how the strategy worked on the previous slide. As long as the power on the secant function is an even number, the first step is to pull out a secant squared in order to be part of the du. So secant to the sixth power is getting separated into secant to the fourth and secant squared. Now this secant squared part, this is going to be r du. Let's write that on the side because it's a substitution that we're going to be doing. What does that mean that the 
u is equal to, u would have to be equal to tangent. We are back constructing it. Now that we know what our substitution is, let's go ahead and execute it. I'm going to write down the easy parts first. Tangent to the 23rd power will be u to the 23rd power. This part we're going to deal with in a second, so I'm just going to leave some space. And finally, this part, of course, gives us our du. Now, for this remaining piece, we need to write this in terms of our u, in terms of tangent. Remember what we said on the previous slide. We indicated what we're supposed to be doing. We're going to rewrite the remaining even power of secant, the part that's not part of the du, whatever's left over, in terms of our u value by using this trig identity. Now, secant to the fourth power is the same thing as secant squared squared. Let's write that down. This is like secant squared all quantity squared because it's secant to the fourth power and 2 times 2 gives me 4. Now we can use the trig identity. Inside the parentheses here, this secant squared inside is equal to 1 plus tangent squared. There we go. That's what we needed. Now that we have tangents for this piece, we can use u is equal to tangent. So we're getting 1 plus u squared. That's our 1 plus tangent squared, and that is all squared. Okay, now we have a completely reasonable problem. We just got to foil it out and figure it out term by term. Taking the antiderivative of each individual piece here, using the power rule, we get our final answer, and then we put the x's back in. Phew, finally, this long thing is our answer. And here is our final set of rules for this video. The final rule for powers of secants and tangents is if the power of tangent is odd, then what we do is we pull out a secant tangent to be part of the du. Notice that if the original power of tangent is odd and we pull out just one of those tangents together with a secant, the remaining power of tangents will be even. So we will need to rewrite the remaining even powers of tangent using this trig identity. Also notice that similar to the previous rule, here we're just specifying if n the power of tangent is odd, then you should pull out a secant tangent to be part of the du. The other power could be absolutely anything. Let's do an example. Now notice in this example that the power on tangent is an odd number of 7, and the power on secant is an even number of 8. Now something to keep in mind about these rules is that as long as you apply them consistently according to the rules, it will work and you will get the right answer. So because the power on secant is even, actually there's a second method to figure out the answer to to this problem. You could do the first rule that we did that says if the power on the secant is even, then pull out secant squared. What we're going to do is the other rule. Doesn't matter which one that you apply, as long as it applies, you can apply it. So the other rule says that if the power on the tangent is odd, then I should be pulling out a tangent and a secant. So I rewrite the seventh power of tangent as tangent to the sixth times tangent. That's pulling out one tangent, and the secant is going to get written as secant to the seventh times secant. That way, I also pull out a secant. Okay, just pulling things together here. Remember, we can always multiply in any order so I can easily rearrange these. Just gathering up over on the side, in order to be part of the du, we're going to have tangent times secant as our du. So here we go. Now let's write this down on the side. What do you get when you take the antiderivative of that? What is u equal to? I hope you know what that is. It's secant. So let's carefully translate each one of the terms here in terms of our substitution. Now if u is equal to secant, then secant to the seventh is simply u to the seventh. And the remaining piece are the du. So now we've got this piece left over. Tangent to the sixth power. Remember that the trig identity is in terms of tangent squared. So tangent to the sixth power is the same as tangent squared cubed. Now this tangent squared is going to be rewritten using the trig identity. Inside the cube, this tangent squared inside here is equal to secant squared minus 1. Now we're ready to go. So we've got u squared minus 1 quantity cubed. Okay, now this problem has a little bit more foiling than the others, but still, it's not that hard conceptually from this point forward. We just have to foil it so we can't foil anymore, and then do the power rule on each individual piece. Just continuing to foil until we can't foil anymore. Finally, we can take the antiderivative and put the x's back in. Here, u is equal to secant. And finally, here is our long answer to this problem. If you take the derivative of the answer, you will get the original quantity. So I hope you enjoyed this video on integration of powers of trig functions.
This section is really testing your ability to use trig identities and to really be fluid with substitution. These problems can get pretty challenging, so take a look at the book before you come to class, and we'll see you soon. Yeah.